but that ministers were censured for not attending upon synods, I can give as good authority for it as Mr. Curry's own testimony in his vindication, page 209, where he tells us from Mr. Calderwood's manuscript history, quote, the bishops had so far prevailed that the authority that they had purchased at that woeful assembly holding at Glasgow was not controlled or called in question even by the whole synods, except some few, who were confined before the act of Glasgow, or were since confined, for not subjecting themselves to their authority in the diocesan synods. Unquote. It is true that ministers were confined after the 1610 for not subjecting themselves to the authority of bishops in the diocesan synods. That Mr. Curry has soon forgot what he read in Calderwood's manuscript history when he tells his reader a few pages after that he has not read of any one person censured or reproved by synod or high commission for not attending upon synods. As for Mr. Curry's above allegiance, that not one was censured for not attending upon synods, I doubt not, but Mr. Curry has read in Calderwood's history, page 654, that the high commission put in execution acts of assemblies overruled by themselves, and likewise Mr. Curry has read that the pretended assembly at Glasgow enacted, quote, that whatsoever minister without just cause or lawful excuse made himself absent from the visitation or the diocesan assembly, he shall be suspended from his office and benefice, and if he amend not, shall be deprived." Unquote. And this act made many ministers obnoxious to the High Commission Court, before whom they were prosecuted for nonconformity. And, since it was not till the year 1618 that the Perth Articles became the trial of ministers, it is to me evident and plain that the process for nonconformity before the commission court that did take place before 1618 were chiefly because ministers refused to submit to the authority of bishops in the diocese and synods, or, which is the same thing, because they refused to sit in synods. As for what concerns the state of presbyteries during this period, I shall refer the reader to what I have observed from the apologetic relation, defense pages 218 and 219, as also to the account that I give of the state of presbyteries for Mr. Woodrow's history, page 217. Mr. Curry reckons that Mr. Woodrow has labored under a mistake in the account that he gives, vindication, page 229. But Mr. Woodrow supports his relation from some remarks made by Mr. Robert Douglas. Likewise, I observed that the presbyteries during this period continued in an independent state upon any general assembly till the Lord turned back the captivity of his people in the year 1638. Mr. Curry entirely omits this when he pretends in the Vindication, page 234, to report my opinion with relation to the conduct of presbyteries in the same period. And if the state of presbyteries is considered, particularly as I have reported the same from the Apologetic Relation, Defense, page 219, the reader may easily see that Mr. Curry's argument from honest ministers continuing to meet in their presbyteries in that period does not conclude for our continuing in the judicatories in this present period. There is yet another thing advanced by Mr. Curry to support his argument, that is, that during the period before 1638, the witnessing ministers did not then erect themselves into separate judicatories from the then assemblies of syn or synods, essay page 14 and the vindication page 220. Upon this head I grant to Mr. Curry that they did not so, but then I might observe, as I did in the defense, page 223, that if they had followed this course, they might have expected, according to the violence and tyranny of these times, the same treatment that Mr. Welsh and his brethren met with for holding an assembly at Aberdeen. I give the reader likewise the judgment of a very considerable minister of this church, that is, Mr. James Melville, concerning the manner after which he thought the Lord's witnesses in that period should have testified, as the same is expressed in a letter he sent from England to one of his confined brethren in Scotland. It is set down at length, Calderwood's History, page 614, where he has the following words, quote, Alas, if that spirit of action, zeal, and courage that sometimes did mightily reign in our kirk were kindled up again, that might make a few from even Presbyterian province to convene together in the name of Christ and censure these corruptors of the kirk to the utmost, unquote. In the above words, this eminent minister does very plainly give his judgment not only for secession from the corrupt party at that time, but also for meeting together in a distinct judicative capacity from them in order to exercise the key of discipline for censuring them. Mr. Curry makes some exceptions to this testimony in his vindication, page 214, where he says, quote, All that is said in that, latter, in that letter will not prove that it was Mr. Vel Melville's stated judgment that honest men ought to have made a secession at that time, unquote. 
But in the above words, Mr. Melville gives his judgment very plainly, that honest ministers should have met in a distinct judicative capacity from the corrupt party. Mr. Curry adds, quote, This letter was writ 1609 and before 1610, which last was the year, according to Mr. Wilson, when honest ministers began to withdraw from synods, unquote. But in whatever year it was writ, it plainly contains Mr. Melville's judgment for the meeting of honest ministers in a distinct judicative capacity from such as were carrying on the course of defection, which is the thing I plead for. Mr. Curry further adds that the above words, quote, were openly a pathetic wish to see such Judases censured as had betrayed the Church of Scotland, unquote. But the above words of Mr. Melville's letter are a plain pathetic wish that honest ministers might meet in a distinct judicative capacity for the effect mentioned, which still is the thing I plead for. Mr. Curry subjoins, quote, Mr. Melville in that letter plainly condemns the brethren's conduct, for he wished there were a few from every presbytery, which few would amount to upwards of 130, a few from every presbytery being at least two from every presbytery. A few, says he, cannot do it, and a competent number of many is not to be looked for, unquote. But I may also, in a very great consistency with the brethren's conduct, and with that I have been pleading for, both in the defense and in this continuation, earnestly wish that there were a few from every presbytery to meet in a distinctive judicative capacity from the present judicatories who are carrying on a course of defection, in order to make a judicial confession of the truths of Christ, and to testify particularly and expressly against the injuries that have been done our highest Lord in his person, truths, and members. But alas! A few cannot censure effectually the ringleaders of, in the present course of defection, and a competent number of many is not to be looked for, till, as Mr. Melville expresses himself in the same letter, quote, The Lord arise and make his musters. It is time, O Lord, arise. It is time, O Lord, arise. It is time. For they have made thy word and law irrit and of no avail. They have left Jacob in servitude and Judah in captivity, unquote. As for that memorable period of this church betwixt 1638 and 1649, it is plain that Mr. Curry in his essay loads the assembly 1638 and several of the assemblies of that period with very unwarrantable and odious proceedings. He complains in his vindication pages 23, 24, and 25 that I do not notice what he declares in, his, in the preface to his essay to be his main end and design in giving instances of the faults, failings, and bad acts of assemblies during the period mentioned, such as he gives the said acts that we may confess, grieve for, and avoid them, as also to show that if such or such things were not ground of secession or separation in the former period of this church, they cannot be such now. So Mr. Curry thinks fit to express himself in the preface to the essay, page 5. I do not intend to take up the reader's time in searching into the misrepresentations that he makes and the reflections that he is pleased to cast upon acts of assemblies in the former period of this church, I shall only offer the few following observations which I think sufficient to take off the force of his argument as it is laid against the present secession from his alleged instances of faults, failings, and bad acts in the period of our church betwixt 1638 and 1650. First, I grant that the church militant in her purest times is never perfect. In her best times there may be something still defective or wanting as to the beauty and order of that house of God, and there may be something culpable in the administration. This is what the Associate Presbytery acknowledged with respect to the period mentioned. Act and Testimony, page 18. But yet, secondly, this church endeavored and mercifully attained a considerable pitch of reformation during the foresaid period. All her several contendings and wrestlings, all her solemn vows and engagements, her declarations and testimonies pointed towards reformation. Thirdly, it is quite otherwise in the present period. This national church, as represented in her present judicatories, is so far from holding fast what we have attained in reformation or contending towards the same that she is letting slip these things that we have attained and the judicatories are justifying themselves in their several defections and backslidings. And therefore I reckon that the former period of this church was a reforming period and that the present is a period of defection and backsliding. Hence, fourthly, I observe the following differences betwixt the present and the former periods of this church. That is, in the period from 1638 to 1650, the general and habitual course and tendency of the proceedings of the judicatories of this church was towards reformation, whereas the general tendency of the judicatories in the present period is towards backsliding and deformation. And therefore, when the present and former periods are compared, I humbly judge that the associate presbytery, in emitting their judicial act and testimony, 
did take what was the most proper step in a testimony of this kind, that is, in mentioning the defections and backslidings of this church, they begin where the progress in Reformation work began to stop, and when this church began to make a retrograde motion, they began at that time, when the sluice was opened to the violent current of backsliding, when the run with an impetuous torrent to this very day, that is in the year 1650, when the public resolutions were entered into, whereby the enemies to our covenanted work of reformation were brought into places of power and public trust, and though at the glorious revolution 1688 great and wonderful things were done by the hand of providence, yet we soon forgot the Lord's mighty works. Instead of endeavoring to recover the steps of reformation once attained unto, and instead of advancing and making progress in reformation work, we are at this day sunk in degeneracy and defection from the Lord. There is one thing advanced by Mr. Curry, which seems to be laid against which I have now advanced in his vindication, page 24, where he says, quote, What reformation was in the period between 1638 and 1650 was mainly done by the Assembly 1638, unquote. By which words? Mr. Curry seems plainly to tell his reader that no main piece of reformation was done in all that period except what was done by the assembly 1638. Though that assembly were instrumental in the Lord's hand in doing great things, yet I humbly judge there were main pieces of reformation begun and carried on after the said assembly. As for instance, though our doctrine was found as it is held forth in our first confession of faith, which was received and professed from the beginning of our reformation. Yet I think it was a considerable piece of reformation when our doctrine was more fully and more clearly held forth, in opposition not only unto the errors of the Church of Rome, but also unto the Arminian and other errors which had sprung up in the Church after the Reformation had begun. And this is done in our Confession of Faith compiled at Westminster and received by the Church of Scotland anon 1647. Likewise, these excellent summaries of our Reformed doctrine by way of question and answer in our larger and shorter catechisms excel at anything of this kind that was done either at or before 1638. Again, our Presbyterian church government is indeed held forth in our second book of discipline, but yet the form of church government laid down by the Assembly at Westminster and received by the Church of Scotland anon 1645 excels the second book of discipline, especially in two particulars. First, the scripture proofs for the several propositions in our form of church government are distinctly laid down, which is not done in our book of discipline. And secondly, the scripture warrant for the meetings of the ruling offices, officers, excuse me, and each particular congregation for the government and discipline thereof is also distinctly expressed in our form of church government. But this is not done in our book of discipline. Likewise, though the ordinances of worship were pure from the first beginning of our Reformation, yet we had no such directory for worship as this, which was agreed upon by the assembly at Westminster and received by the Reforming Church of Scotland in the year 1645. Also, I cannot but reckon the covenanted uniformity among the three nations of further and main step of reformation. It was a step of reformation further than what was attained unto at the 1638, or before that time. And therefore, as I cannot agree with Mr. Curry in his above-mentioned assertion, that is, that what reformation was in this period of the church was mainly done by the assembly at Glasgow, so likewise, for the above reasons, I reckon the period mentioned was a reforming period, and that several considerable advances were made in the said period towards reformation. I intend not to pursue Mr. Curry in the reflections he casts upon some particular acts of the assemblies in the period of our church, neither do I think it necessary. I hope all true Presbyterians will own the period between 1638 and 1650 to be a reforming period, yea, a period wherein this church in her ecclesiastical capacity made considerable progress in reformation, though at the same time she met with considerable opposition in carrying on the reformation work. And therefore, one of the ends mentioned, as above, by Mr. Curry, why he tells us the faults or failings of the period of that period of the church, that is, quote, if such or such things were not ground of secession or separation then, they cannot be such now, unquote. This, I say, is to no purpose in the present argument in regard whatever faults, failings, or defects she had in the foresaid period, she must be considered as a reforming church at that time, but in the present period she cannot, even according to Mr. Curry's own acknowledgment, be called a reforming church.